Any person desiring to learn how to heal the sick can receive of the undersigned instruction that will enable them to commence healing on a principle of science with a success far beyond any of the present modes. No medicine, electricity, physiology, or hygiene required for unparalleled success in the most difficult cases. I've lived in the south of England all my life, first on the Isle of Wight, then in Southampton, then Fareham, and now in Portsmouth, and in every location I've noticed at least one Christian Science reading room. Here's one in Portsmouth. It sells such books as the Christian Science Journal, which claims that evolution and creationism, properly conceived, are identical. Now, because of the presence of said books, and, of course, the word science in their name, I always assume that Christian science is essentially a synonym of creationism. You know, a library of alternative facts where facts that can't be forced into the biblical narrative are discarded. But evidently, it's not. Well, it kind of is, but it's more of an alternative medicine than an alternative science. And you know the thing about alternative medicine, right? By definition, I begin, alternative medicine, I continue, has either not been proved to work or been proved not to work. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. This is Christian Science Debunked. So what exactly is Christian Science? That's a good question, loyal subscriber. Allow me to provide the answer. Christian Science is simply a set of beliefs and practices belonging to a denomination of Christianity, just like, say, Jehovah's Witnesses or Latter-day Saints, and it was first developed in the 19th century by Mary Baker Eddy. Now, Mary made some outrageous claims, but before I get to them, I want to reiterate a point that I've already made. Christian science has absolutely nothing to do with science. In fact, it's the rejection of medical science. Critics often say that it's neither Christian or science. Uh, the, the Christian is the easy part. She clearly was a Christian uh, and, and very much out of, a, of Christian tradition. There's no problem there. Uh, the science part, uh, if you want to be narrow about what science is and, and you begin to uh, place it in specific disciplines, it doesn't seem like science. But if we're talking about an inquiry, uh, if we're talking about a quest to solve problems uh, and to deal with, with scientific problems, um, uh, it does make sense. You know, I wonder, is this man Jordan Peterson sensei? I mean, redefining science in order to call Christianity science seems well up Jordan Street. It depends on what you mean by Jesus. Jokes aside, and as the sensei implicitly admitted, Mary's Christian science has about as much to do with science as Deepak Chopra's quantum consciousness has to do with quantum mechanics. None. But just as Chopra's cult insists the contrary, so too do Christian scientists, such as this preacher. Science is the study of something. Christian science is the study of the Christ, the study of the life and teachings of Christ Jesus. Now, notice how loose-weave this definition is. Using it, we could say that Buddhism is Buddhist science, since it's the study of Buddha. Or, indeed, that those who study the Loch Ness Monster are Loch Ness scientists, couldn't we? In fact, using this definition, Flat Earthers could call themselves Flat Earth scientists, because they are, after all, studying the flatness of the Earth, aren't they? My point being, of course, is that this trick can be played by any cult or pseudoscience, and indeed, it often is. Science is a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through use of the scientific method. And now notice the move to a more formal definition of science. This trick, which is a form of equivocation fallacy, is unremitting in religious reasoning. In this case, the preacher uses one definition of science in order to call Christianity science, and then uses another definition of science in order to substantiate the value of science, and her flock simply and erroneously equate the two. Anyhow, since such people claim that Christian science is science, let's look at the peer-reviewed empirical data, shall we? Let's ask, do the tenets of Christian science hold up to scrutiny? Are they really substantiated by science? So, Christian science makes three primary assertions on top of Christianity. That being one, prayer is more effective at healing than conventional medicine. No medicine, electricity, physiology, or hygiene required. Two, disease is entirely caused by our cognition. Matter and disease are like dreams having no existence. 
and three, nothing material exists. Everything is a projection of God's mind. For God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. Let's start with prayer. Now, I plan to dedicate an entire video to the alleged efficacy of prayer, in which I'll directly address the most controversial studies and reveal their atrocious methodology. But for now, I'll keep it brief. Studies have yielded a mixture of results, most showing no effect whatsoever, some showing a benefit, and some actually showing a negative. Now, the fact that some studies show a benefit might well intrigue you, as it did me upon a time, but once you realise that the methodology was flawed, that many have been proven to be fraudulent, and that similarly flawed studies have found benefit with other types of alternative medicine, such as praying to other gods, bloodletting, astrology, and homeopathy, your intrigue will likely dissipate. The truth is that humans are incredibly impressionable creatures, and as such, placebo, confirmation bias, and again, straight-up fraud are ever-present. Now, one of the best criticisms of prayer I've ever heard of comes from Sam Harris, and I'll paraphrase it now. Don't you find it telling that prayer studies are always conducted in relation to unmiraculous events, such as recovery from heart surgery, rather than miraculous events, such as the rejuvenation of lost limbs or even the restoration of blindness, as Jesus apparently achieved? You see, it should be trivially easy to prove the efficacy of prayer, and yet advocates tether their assertions to ambiguous cases. I, like Sam Harris, think this is telling. Moving on, let's look at the claim that disease is entirely caused by our minds. Matter and disease are like dreams, having no existence. Now, to anyone outside of the cult of Christian science, this is an insane assertion, and ironically, profoundly anti-scientific. For one, animals without a brain and fuss without a mind, such as jellyfish, can and do develop diseases, such as cancer, and so this fact alone dispenses with this absurd claim. But as if this wasn't enough, humans have known for eons that while a healthy attitude can help prevent and fight against certain diseases, disease itself is not dependent on the mind. People have, and still do, confront disease with admirable positivity and determination, some truly believing they are well, and yet, in most cases, their disease remains slash remains, and either has or will contribute to their death. What's more, Mary herself evidently suffered from disease and an addiction to morphine throughout her whole life, and the man who introduced her to spiritual healing, Phineas P. Quimby, died from an abdominal tumour, a disease. In January of 1866, Phineas P. Quimby died of an abdominal tumour. He remained convinced to the end of the truth of his mind-healing theory. And last but not least, let's address the assertion that everything, including you and I, are projections of God's mind. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material, he is spiritual. So the first thing to be said is that one ought to prove the existence of a God before insisting that everyone's a product of that God's mind. The second thing to be said is that the concept of the Christian God is largely unfalsifiable, which, ironically, is a big no-no in science. And the third thing to be said is that, other than interpretation of scripture, no evidence or argument seems to be given to substantiate this ridiculous claim. Like, really, none. Now, this reminds me of some wisdom from Carl Sagan, who once said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and that if it's not given, then we're left with little choice but to simply walk away. Or as Christopher Hitchens would have put it, that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Anyhow, before wrapping up, I want to state what I often state when speaking about alternative medicine. It's dangerous. Beliefs inform actions, and actions have consequences, and the consequences of rejecting medical science for Christian science, or indeed any alternative medicine, is devastating. In the last century, at least 100 adults, and very sadly children, have died from treatable illnesses directly because of the preachings of Christian science. And their suffering is but one reason for why I do what I do. As always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have donated via PayPal. 
As of late, most of my videos are being demonetized, and so you alone are keeping me afloat. For as long as you're here, so too am I.